Hi, welcome to Goop Book Club. I'm Kiki, the VP of Content here at Goop, and I'm so excited to be coming to you live today for our June book club pick, which is Circa, whoops, my headphones are caught, I look like a nerd, which is Circa by Devi S. Laskar. Um, and Devi is here with us today. We are chatting live, so if you are watching in real time, please submit any questions you have um, right into the chat box on YouTube, and we will get to them. Um, as a reminder, if you're new here, you can always go to goop.com slash goopbookclub to learn more and see our past picks. But without further ado, um, I am so excited to be talking to Debbie today. So as of, of course, Debbie is the author of Circa as well as the award-winning um, book, The Alice of Reds and Blues. She holds an MFA from Columbia University. Um, she's originally from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and will of course be talking about um, North Carolina today. Um, she now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and on the Q&A she did for us on the site, she recommends some of her favorite food spots in SF. So please be sure to check them out if you haven't already. Um, before I bring Debbie on, I will just say I love this novel. Um, and if you've been following Goop Book Club for a while, you know I'm a sucker for short, slim, and sparing novels that just get right to the heart of the matter. And this story really stuck out to me. Um, the voice was really distinct and different. It's a coming of age story and a love story. Um, it's about uh, three friends um, and two, two of them who, who's, or all three of them's lives are changed in an instant um, when they're in high school after one Halloween walking home. And um, it's about the relationship between two of them a uh, boy and a girl, and as we follow them into adulthood and how they come into and out of their lives again and again. So a lot to talk about, and I will shut up now and bring Devi on. Devi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Kiki. It's such a pleasure. Of course, of course. Um, and you so kindly agreed to start with a short excerpt, and I love just starting this way because I think it grounds us in the, the voice of the book and the spirit of it. So if you want to go ahead and um, you're reading from page 13, is that it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, amazing. Am. Okay, um, I'll get started. Yeah, if you want to jump in, thank you. Sure. Serious Cactus. You bloom at night. Marco calls, but Ma says into the receiver, you are busy for the next couple of years until you go to college that perhaps he should finish his senior year by studying. You are awake as Baba falls asleep in front of the TV, the public television channel host droning on and on about some shift in Reagan's foreign policy ahead of his vice president seeking to replace him next year. You check and learn Ma is already asleep, snoring into her pillow, her small black and white broken. She has not been able to convince Baba to have it repaired. He insists he can fix it himself, and yet all of his efforts to date have resulted in a grease stain on the carpet and a roll of a aluminum foil wasted. You clean your room stridently, making sure you stand atop your chair to drop your history textbook onto the ground for the loud thud. Baba is startled awake and grudgingly rises, turns off the TV in the den with the dark wooden paneling and the orange shag carpet and staggers to the master bedroom. You wait until he turns on the shower, then you turn off your bedroom light and slip downstairs to the laundry room. You put a load of wet towels into the dryer, then close the back door behind you, shoes in hand. There is an envelope with your name on it in the mailbox. You open it to find a blank yellow piece of paper stuffed inside. It is a sign that Marco will be out tonight. He pulls up alongside you to his old Honda as you are set to walk across a big intersection and then follow the access road towards the bus depot. Water tower or Merrick's, he asks, after you exchange smiles and strap on the seatbelt. There are still a few untouched water towers in Raleigh. Once you have not yet decorated with anarchy symbols in stolen red paint. It is a clear night, and there are a few friends of Marco's meeting up for beers and smokes behind Mr. Merrick's convenience store and gas shop. You do not care for those boys or the cigarettes, but they leave you alone since you are Marco's friend. I'll stop there. 
for so many oh, reasons, I can, but oh, can you I can hear me? Hear you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that passage for so many reasons. I think for me, so much of the book and especially that se that section just evoked such a vibe of being young and being in, in high school and that moment of, of waiting for Marco's symbol and, and getting it. Um, and I'm just curious, as you were thinking about creating Hera's character, especially like when she's at this point in her life, this age, what what kind of like drew you and how did you think about recreating that moment of being young, which I think you do so well, even though it's so specific to Hera, obviously in her, her family and her upbringing, who she is as a character. But I think for me, it also just felt so, the specificity of it made it feel so I could just feel like I was right there. How did you kind of think about think about that and that age of her life? Well, um, I, I have a little cheat sheet because I have um, I have children who are roughly that age or were when I was writing this book. And so I kind of peeked at, peeked at them as I was writing. But I also just really wanted to remember what the 80s were like. Um, I know that I didn't um, have a cell phone. No one did, right? And um, we all wrote letters and we used landlines. And I just really wanted to evoke that memory of what it was like to be um, young in the 80s when, you know, there weren't cable channels and there was no, um, you know, personal computer in your pocket. No, totally. Um, what can you talk a little bit too about how you, this story came to you and how, how these characters and sort of how you thought about formatting it? I'm also curious if you can talk a little bit about, and I know you've done this before, but talking about why you chose to write it in the second person. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. So I started this story back in graduate school in 1995. I had a, a real, I had a really good friend um, and I was basically writing about her and our friendship and, and all the, the women friends I had um, in graduate school in New York. And, um, and then um, my friend got sick and she passed away from leukemia. And so I set this book aside. And when I was writing the first version of this story in the 90s, I will say that I, um, I tried everything. I did first person, I did third person, I did omniscient, and it wasn't quite right, but I just kept going. And um, then, you know, I, you know, through no fault of my own, I lost the bulk of my work in 2010. And when I came back to the story um, several years ago, um, I had a classmate who's a wonderful book. Uh, the Buddha in the Attic had come out, and um, here, I'm just going to hold it up for a second. Um, and she had written this wonderful book about these picture brides um, um, who had come from Japan or before World War II. And she had written it in first person plural, and, um, and it was amazing. And that gave me the idea that I should do something in first person plural um and i tried so hard and that didn't work at all so uh but i i tried you i tried second person and it was wonderful and it and i heard hero's voice right away and i was so excited so i decided to stick with it and um so that's how i ended up with second person yeah and i think it's interesting that you mentioned voice because with the second person and I wonder too, if that's a little bit of what I felt. I think sometimes the second person can be jarring when it doesn't land right, because you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling that, I'm not experiencing that. But to me, the voice was so specific and so unique, but at the same time was evoking all of these like emotions and sort of my own memories of childhood, even being so, so different that I felt like it really did land for me even like as the book carried on. And I felt like I got to the point where I was so familiar with her voice that it really resonated throughout. Oh, thank you. I really like second person because I feel like it collapses the distance between the reader and the narrator. And, um, and it's reflexive. So the you is really the I, but the, re the you also invites the reader to come in and be the I. And I really love that. And I, I thought first person plural in my friend's book did the same thing. And I was, I felt like I was part of the journey and I really wanted to kind of emulate that for, for my own novel. Yeah. 
One of the one of the th main things I wanted to talk about was um, Hira's relationship with Marie, and I think that was something for me that really resonated in terms of, and I was just thinking of friends who who I've lost in 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 different ways or people who who aren't in my life anymore, but their presence is so strong. And I thought the way that you described how Marie continued on in, in Hira's life was so poignant. Um, there was this one line in particular, um, this is page, um, this is page 82. And I think this is when Hira is meeting um, Neil and his parents um, and uh, they're at, um, they're having a meal together and it says, you cannot remember a single moment of the mealtime chatter, even as is, even as it is happening. You think of Marie as you look at the serving bowls, select her favorites. And I thought that was such a beautiful detail, just that small thing of how we, we all have people like that in our lives where we, we do these things without even thinking about it. We're just somewhere and we think, oh, the, the tiniest detail, like this is what so-and-so would, would like. Um, and I thought there was other moments like that throughout that book, but it just, reminded me of all the the mundane ways that people continue on in our lives and that we think of them um and yeah i don't know if you could just speak a little bit to how you thought about their friendship because really what happens on the page what we see on the page the majority of their friendship is after um after marie's death but she really is such a character and a presence and just how you thought of mapping that out and how their friendship would continue to evolve and develop e even after her death? Yeah, that's a great question, Kiki. Um, what I really loved about when I was trying to figure uh, moments out like that was I was trying to remember what my friends and I used to do. And for example, there's um, there's the Waltons game in the in the book. And so I definitely included that in, in the story because I, I did that in real life with one of my friends. And so I was like, oh, I have to do that because that reminds me of her. And, you know, um, you know, what you were describing, it makes me really think of like, you know, we always have a song, right? There's always a song that reminds us of people or a certain time. And there's always a, um, you know, like a movie. And uh, so, I think our song was Tiny Dancer um, by Elton John. And then, of course, um, the Joshua Tree album by U2, because that's what was playing on the radio a lot back then. Um, and so I really just wanted to evoke uh, the what was on the radio, because that really reminded me of the friendships of, of the time. And, in, um, and also because, you know, um, I really didn't have... Uh, because it's set in the past, um, I couldn't rely on, uh, you know, Instagram <laughs> and uh, Facebook because it didn't exist. Yeah, um, I think that, and it's it's interesting to me because when I like think about the book afterwards, it's kind of set around these two loves of her life, Marie and Crash. And I think the other thing that was so I don't know, I'm always drawn to these love stories or whatever you want to call them, where people are kind of coming into and, and out of your life and you're you're wondering like how it's going to end up. And um, did you always, I guess I'm wondering like, what was the primary relationship that you thought of? And like, did you know how things would end for Hira and Crash or, or how did it sort of like unfold as you were exploring these characters? And were you ever deciding the tension between what would kind of be the main the main plot of the book and what sort of was your like guiding star if you will oh that's a good question um you know um what i really the question i kept posing to myself um through this entire book was you know um how do we grieve and what are our expectations for grief um especially like now with the pandemic and you know and it's 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 longevity and the young people have lost so much and how do you grieve and i just remember you know the question i kept saying to myself was well if marie had been the one to live and marco had been the one to die then marie coming over and spending the night or marie and hira doing things together all the time would not even be a question right 
but it's because Marie is not the one that is um, around that everyone has these expectations, even though they're not really voiced about what is proper and what is and how people are supposed to grieve, even though, you know, these are the two closest people to Marie, but they're somehow not being allowed to grieve together. And so I just kept asking that question to myself as I kept going. I'm like, well, if it were Marie here at this moment, then this would be happening, but it's the opposite because it's Crash that's here. Hmm. Yeah. And even as I was asking that question, I was thinking to what is the a guide for me as I was reading it was wondering beyond Marie and, and Crash was how like Hira, how Hira's life would, I don't want to say just how Hira's life would turn out. That sounds so stupid, but just where she would be able to exert agency in going mm -hmm. with what you're saying with her grieving process, but also like beyond that, her life, like she was in many ways caught in, I don't know, a trap of identity and also like we all are and then also had all of these like additional expectations on her in ways that her kind of like these roads that she could follow in her life mm -hmm. and you saw the ways that maybe those paths like could be right for her but then the w ways where she was trying to figure out what it was that she truly wanted to do and how she would like exert her her agency or where she would kind of find control in her life um and I, I think at the same time, like there are some books where can go too far in, in that direction where it's like, okay, we're going to get rid of like all tradition. And it's like, it has this negative connotation, but I thought you, one thing I loved about the book was how you portrayed her relationship with her parents, which was this really complex, but also beautiful and, and loving and respectful. And I think really honest and, and intimate. So I would love to hear about that, but I thought I loved just this past is when I sort of think about sort of the existential nature of, of what she was going through. This is silhouettes on the, on the bottom of page 105. It says, you wonder if your whole life will be like this, wondering and wishing aloud for things that are so far away, you may as well be wishing for one of Saturn's rings, one of Jupiter's moons. The stars are impossibly plentiful tonight, not an inch of sky is wasted. You look until you see the Big Dipper. You remember Marco's presentation, the way he could spin a myth about the stars. You wonder if you can walk away, but you are so unprepared. Maybe you can walk away a week from now, a month from now, when you're ready. Um, and I, that so resonated with me, this idea of feeling, having those moments where you feel like a desire that you have is just so beyond reach or feeling like you're stuck or caught in something and kind of wondering like if you'll have the courage to get out of it. Um, so that was a very long-winded comment, <laughs> but I'm just curious, how did you think of sort of the, this, you know, her coming of age and the existential nature of it while also bringing in her family's identity and her, her cultural history and traditions and, and melding all these things in a way that felt honest, um, yeah. Thank you. That's such a great question. So I will tell you a, a quick, funny story. Um, so obviously in the 1990s, I was in my 20s. And so I was really, um, I was really identifying with uh, Hera as the character as I was going along. And um, when I came back to this book uh, three years ago, um, I was much older and I started to really identify with the parents <laughs> and, um, and actually my beta reader, she was very funny. She, um, my really good friend, who's my beta reader for a long time. She, she read the version of it and she said, you know, you gave the epiphany to the wrong person. And I was like, what? And she's like, you gave your change to the mom and not the daughter. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. But I'm so, I'm so much older now. And so I actually was really pleased that I got a second stab at this book because um, I got to look at it from two points of view and, and try and balance it. Um, I think it was really important for me that uh, that we have no villains, right? There are no villains, because um, that's too easy. And I think a lot of people do that. Um, 
and not intentionally, of course, nobody wants to do something like that, but you know, everything is complicated, right? And in real life, things are really complicated. There is no just, you know, stark answer, you know, black and white. And so I felt really that it was so important that I just make it as balanced as possible. And it was my first attempt at a happy ending. And so I <laughs> I really wanted to just get there and be like, okay, I, I have to like build something so that I can earn my happy ending. And so that's what I kept like, when I kept going through the book and saying, well, I think I need to fill this hole here or I need to add a little bit here. I'm like, well, how is this gonna just make sure that I get to my, to get to my first attempt at a happy ending. <laughs> and so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> no, you I did. It was totally, it. <laughs> no, no, you did. It was totally earned. Yeah. I was thinking about that. I mean, I think in a way I'm kind of like, let's bring back happy endings in the books that deal, have a darkness and a realness to them, because I think there are a lot of books that show especially women characters struggling and not that you know and even the ending of this book it's not like everything is like rainbow and butterflies and you're like there's never going to be a moment of of grief or suffering but i think maybe too often in fiction the pendulum swings kind of the other way where we don't see um women characters who struggle and have doubts but who in the end find their find their footing to a certain extent and are aren't punished for it um right. so i appreciate that there was that that ending on it and i think in terms of crash and hira it was so it was so deserved it was one of those things that you you didn't know how it was going to go but there were so many sweet moments between them um like i love the moment when uh, Crash comes to the airport that she's she's back in town for the weekend and she's like, what are you doing here? Um, and, you know, she's like, OK, let's go get a drink. And she's and he says something like your dad's been circling the airport for like 17 times like we can't. <laughs> um, and then those those moments at the end where they re where they reconnect, they felt so they felt so true to me. Like, I think I think what page is it? Um, I mean, there were so many great details about Crash, but this one on page um wait no this isn't it um it's when they i mean even this moment this wasn't our singing but on 167 where they're both still wearing their wedding rings and yes and she goes your eyes sting a little at first and then you smile to yourself that you're both the same kind of human wearing wedding rings even after the marriages are over you're both the same kind of human hopeful but slow to change um, I thought like that was a wonderful moment. The thing I'm looking for is when they have their kiss. Oh, I love this scene. I mean, it was a little heartbreaking, but also loved it when Crash has disappeared and Hira is out trying to track him down. This is in the city and she sees him in a car kissing a woman inexplicably. Um, and she goes, you want to slap that, that face bloody. This is page 124. You want to slap that face, that face bloody and yank that bombshell out of the car by her hair. You can feel the heat of your own anger rise past your neck, inflaming your cheeks. Shame at the notion that Crash might think you are blushing. You can almost feel your soul leave your body and run away. Your knees tremble. With all of the bravado you have left within, you put your arms around his neck and draw your face close to his. Your eyes meet and his eyes look exactly the same as he did hours before when you argued over modern English in his apartment. You flex your feet upward and kiss him, tasting the other woman's cherry flavored lipstick. Your first kiss if you don't count the one he stole at the water tower so long ago. He returns the kiss for a moment, then steps back. I mean, I, I, you suck in your breath and drop your arms to your side. Love her. I thought like, what a great, I mean, I, that like deserves to be like in a rom-com movie. I just <laughs> thought it was so... <laughs> And that round comes like the wrong reference, but I just thought it was so cinematic and had like sort of this classic feel to it. And even in its like specificity, I could just see it playing out. Um, what were those scenes like for you to write between Crash and Hira? Um, maybe that one in particular, if you could talk about. So, you know, I really just, um, 
I wanted that, that, you know, I'm, I'm trying so hard as a poet, you know, um, I've been a poet for a long time and, and I was a reporter for a long time. And so I've had a lot of people over the years tell me to keep it short. <laughs> and so um, I've, I've tried really hard, you know, to not write the pieces um, or to take out the pieces, because I think we all write them, that, you know, make your eyes glaze over and, and think about what you're eating for dinner that night. But um, so this, this scene and, and a lot of scenes between them, they were so much longer to start. And then I, you know, one of my tricks is that, uh, that I learned from my poetry teacher is that to read it out loud, right? Um, so as I was reading this book um, out loud to myself, you know, when, when, when it was going on too long and I was drawing too many breaths or my tongue would trip, then I just knew that that, that didn't belong there. And that's how it just got whittled down um, because there were moments that I knew that it was going on too long because I was breathing in too much or, or I had, um, or I had, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, stumbled a few times in the sentence. And so I, um, I, that's how I, I learned to do that. And it took practice, you know, um, that's how I did my first novel as well. I just kept reading it aloud to myself until it sounded right. I love that you mentioned that that wasn't something I thought to ask, but the book does have such a lyrical quality to it, the prose. Um, and it's also funny because we, the question we just got from a listener, Elizabeth, um, I love this book, though at times tragic, is also a love story with a lot of humor and even a mystery suspense. How do you make all of that work in such a short book? Which is just interesting that you were just talking about that, but were there, um, were there points, and I know this book had many lights, but in the editing process, was the length of the book always once you kind of like got to this version of it where it ended up or were there other things where you other ways that you sort of wanted to tighten or yeah just other how, how did you and also I think that's an interesting question in terms of like packing in all of these different elements because a lot of the books that I do love that are very short and slim and sparing it's like there isn't a lot of plot um but this one I think is a good point that Elizabeth makes is in addition to these kind of the voice and all of these different classic elements there were a lot of plot points so maybe you could speak a little bit more to that too sure um thank you um yeah i you know i really wanted to write a book that talked about choices and consequences right and so um a lot of my favorite books um although they are not technically mysteries they have a lot of suspense in them right and so, um, like I said, I just don't want to write a book that has villains in it. And so um, I want there to be mystery but and suspense, but it's not like a whodunit. It's more like a, how did we get here? Um, these are the choices that, I, that my character got to make. These are the choices that were made for her and what are the consequences and how did we get there? And, um, and I think that, um, uh they that oh and i see that there's a another question about why did they persist in their relationship i think because you know crash and hera um it's such a good question um crash and hera they loved marie and they were a trio and uh, marie is gone and the two people who loved her the most are not even allowed to grieve together and i think that is why they keep coming back for each other and trying to to connect because they have there's just one other person in the world who really knows how they feel that's beautiful um before i let you go tell us can you tell us anything you're you're currently writing or working on or and or and or something you're reading that we should know about oh sure um yes uh so i um i'm actually trying to finish my next novel um, it's due at the end of the summer. Um, it's called Midnight at the War, and it's about a brown-skinned female foreign correspondent who is pregnant, and the baby may or may not be her husband's, and she has been reassigned to a war zone, and she is having a hard time. And it's also a book about who gets to tell the truth in the news, and um, 
and what that looks like, depending on who gets to tell it. Yeah, and I am actually reading a whole bunch of things right now. Um, but uh, one of the books that I just finished, I will hold up. Um, it It's called Minor Feelings by Kathy. Ooh, so good. Good it one. Is a non, yeah, it's a nonfiction book, but it also tells the story of... Um, of this poet that died tragically um, several decades ago. And and it's just beautiful, really, really beautiful book. I'm just very excited about it. Yeah, Kathy's amazing. We actually had her on the Goop podcast. Uh, it might have been a couple of years now. I'm losing track of time, but um, <laughs> yeah, highly recommend too. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks thank so you much. for writing this beautiful book. We so love it. Um, I'm going to let you go before I do the last few announcements, but um, thank you so much. It was lovely to chat and hopefully talk soon. Okay. Thank you so much, Kiki. Of course. Okay. Last announcements. Thank you all for joining today. Um, we, If you haven't already, obviously pick up a copy of Circa. It's a wonderful very special read. Um, you can always go to goop.com slash goop book club to see our past picks and other reading racks. Um, we are going on a little bit of a hiatus, but you can always follow us on goop for more reading racks. And I'm working on putting together a summer roundup. So stay tuned for that. And if you have any other requests, um, hit us up on goop on social so I can know all about them. And that is it for today. Um, thank you again for joining and we will talk to you later. Okay. Bye.